Almost everybody in this room remembers 9-11 and where they were at 9-11 during the time. At that point in time, I was a graduate student uh, watching it on TV at Wisconsin, University of Wisconsin-Madison. And I found out that one of my friends was, in fact, one of the jumpers in that. And, and that hit me very hard, as, as some of my closer friends can, can testify to. Uh, at Wisconsin, I, I pretty much researched mostly pure type science and all of that. I immediately transformed uh, into doing research in support of homeland defense and national security uh, and, and to commercializable products. I finished up my PhD at uh, University of Michigan, which was great. And I immediately came down to Louisiana Tech where I set up a small group. If you get into this business, you need to have a, a certain set of students. They, they need to have clearances uh, off of that. And I amassed a relatively large group of people and started getting supported uh, by, by a number of funding agencies in the business, per se. You can say what you want about nuclear power. There are pros and cons to all sources of electrical energy when you get down to it. Nuclear power does have decades of operational safety in the United States, exceeding a lot of other energy producers. There are zero greenhouse gas emissions. They have incredible power densities, unrivaled by any other technology when you get down to it. And it's a source of domestic energy production, which means jobs for the region. One thing that I like in particular about nuclear power, when you get down to it, is about 40% of the fuel used in our reactors, this is not well known, uh, is actually fuel that has been processed from ex-Soviet nuclear weapons. So you have a group of people uh, from the United States and internationally helping uh, those countries dismantle nuclear weapons that used to be pointed at my daughter in a large city and your children off that, taking them apart carefully, uh, taking the fuel out, putting it into containers, safeguarding those containers, bringing it across the ocean, and putting it into use in our facilities to make power. So I would say it's a good thing to leave your lights on. <laughs> One problem is there are some other individuals out there looking for that material also when you get down to it. Uh, no matter what your race or your creed or where you're from, you always, most countries have a couple of individuals that are driven by hatred or by ignorance. Or they're just plain nuts. And they've decided they want to kill as many people as possible. Now, this slide you might say is a little bit dated. Most of the people in this slide are in fact dead at this point. The global large-scale terrorism business is not conducive to longevity when you get down to it. But the final slide there testifies to the fact that for everybody dead, there's always hundreds of people eager to take their place to acquire weapons of mass destruction, to process them, and to utilize them against the most weak. So when my daughter was five, she asked me, as a lot of daughters do, what do you do for your job? Uh, and, and I'm still paying for therapy for her. Uh, <laughs> with this slide that I make. So I apologize for the weird drawings on there. This is the slide that I made for my daughter. And I explained to her, well, if you want to get into the global nuclear terrorism business, you need to do a couple of things. If you're a terrorist, the terrorist is in red there. The, the color has nothing to do with, with anything. It's, it's a random color. Terrorists come in all colors. You need to find a bomb maker because typically the skill set of bringing a nuclear weapon across an ocean and detonating and willing to take your life in the process is a different set of skills than the ability to make a nuclear weapon and get it going and twick it out. So you need to find a bomb maker. You need to get a hold of a bomb maker, get together, talk a little bit, construct a nuclear bomb, get it financed, put it into some form of a box, some container, and get that box containing the nuclear material across some body of water and get it into a large city and then detonate it. Well, if you're on the other team, if you're on the other side of the fence, if you're trying to find these guys, then the objective is going to be to try to detect this material. Ideally, you find these guys, perhaps from the characteristics of the material, but you want to make sure when you detect the material, what you're detecting is actually fissionable material, not something else. And so the making of detectors to find these things actually is quite challenging off of that. And that is a field that I normally do. If you're an insomniac, like I am, you wake up at 3 a.m. and you'll turn on the TV and you'll see Jane Fonda with one of those yellow devices. They're a Geiger counter on some lunar landscape off there surveying 
the area. Uh, there's a good reason for that. Geiger counters are the detector of choice, but they don't detect neutrons off of that. Neutrons are neutral. That's why they call them neutrons. Well, my field is nanotechnology when you get down to it. There's a lot of hype in nanotechnology. They say that it's going to make products that can revolutionize things. That's possible. We're still in its infancy, in my opinion. There's a material called gadolinium. If you've never heard of it, I don't blame you. Very few people have. It's not a very commonly used material. But it has one characteristic. When a neutron hits it, it makes an electron. I said neutrons are hard to detect because they're neutral. And again, that's why they call them neutrons. But if they convert them into electrons, electrons you can detect. Electrons make electricity. That's why they call them electrons. Well, we have developed a way to turn the gadolinium into nanoparticles. And that is important because nanoparticles can be made so they're actually smaller than light. They're smaller than the wavelength of light. They become effectively invisible. The middle picture that you see is a scintillator, which converts these electrons into light. And you'll see it's transparent, despite the fact it's 30% gadolinium. To my knowledge, that's the largest doping of gadolinium into a detector. So it's a transparent detector. That's good. It passes light. It's also hard to see. The final picture is a very, very, very small detector next to a dime that is doped with gadolinium that can be used to detect a neutron flux. So it's a detector you can put in a lot of places that are very hard to see. And so that product is getting out there into the field. We've successfully brought that into a limited marketplace. It's been funded by a number of people uh, for a variety of uses. I'm kind of excited about that. Nuclear terrorism is clearly a very large national and international problem. Perhaps an even bigger problem is what's going to make the fuel to power transportation in the future? There's also a global problem and a national problem. Three specific challenges regarding fossil fuels to our country is that the United States consumes about a quarter of the world's oil, but we only produce about 4% at this point in time. Oil imports are roughly half our trade deficit. A substantial part of that money funds countries whose interests are at odds with ours. Cap and trade, wherever your political stance is on that, uh, that is the, the potential taxing and tariffing of carbon dioxide emissions, whatever your thoughts on that, uh, it's a market reality. The reality is there is a moratorium on many plants that produce carbon dioxide because you do have to pay to get rid of it, and that influences whether you're going to build one or not. So it would be nice if the energy of our future cut down on the carbon footprint. Well, there's a few different strategies being pursued off of that. One's electric cars. That's, of course, batteries. The problem with that is batteries have about one-tenth of the kick per pound of battery as per pound of gasoline. That's why they're really only used in inner city. They're not good for the long hauls, which diesel trucks are. Natural gas was widely touted during the last election as a good solution off of that. We don't have a natural gas distribution network to fuel our cars with that. We don't have natural gas vehicles being mass produced like we do the standard combustion engines out there. So for large marketplaces, that's going to take a lot of doing to make happen. There's hydrogen cars. That is possibly a very great solution in the future. We don't know how to make the hydrogen. We don't know how to store the hydrogen. And we don't really know how to use the hydrogen to make cars when you get down to it. But I do know that on the road right now are diesel trucks in the sky are planes that use jet fuel, and in the sea are boats that use lots and lots of liquid fuel. So it would be nice if we could come up with a technology that finds something besides crude to make liquid fuel. Well, turns out that already happened. That was made by the Germans during World War I. The first picture is Hans Fischer and Franz Trope. That's the original Hans and Franz from Germany. And they did pump you up. They pumped up Germany. They produced lots and lots and lots of fuel. During World War I, the Germans wanted to continue fighting uh, after we took away their, their diesel and their fuel from the Mideast and other sources. So they found out a way to convert coal into liquid fuel. You see two flasks there. The clear one is the good stuff. That's the synthetic fuel made from coal. It's clear as opposed to the other one. Why? Because it has no sulfur in it. This process produces sulfur-free fuel when you get down to it. It's not that hard. It's not that hard. You can look at the picture. There's a catalyst. The trick's always in the catalyst. The catalyst they used is iron. What happens is you have carbon monoxide and molecular hydrogen gas. They hit the catalyst and they bond together and they make water and they make chains 
of carbon and hydrogen, otherwise known as liquid fuel, as gasoline, as diesel, as jet fuel. We make a catalyst too. We have incorporated, uh, we've been capitalized and started a company making a pilot plant off of our technology. We use cobalt. We don't use iron. Iron makes diesel as a catalyst and liquid fuel. Cobalt makes it also. Iron oxide makes diesel. That's rust. That's corroded iron. Cobalt oxide does not. Cobalt oxide makes a disposal problem. Uh, we nanostructure this cobalt in part because cobalt is also an order of ma many orders of magnitude more expensive than the iron. So by making it small with lots of surface area, we're able to beat the economics. Why would we mess around with cobalt in the first place? Well, it has one characteristic that iron does not have. Per unit of natural gas pumped in, it makes three times as much diesel. That's good from a business enterprise because you can sell diesel for money. Clean coal technology has made amazing strides uh, in, in the time that I've been alive. It used to be when you'd go up into Canada, you'd see acres and acres of trees as far as you can see dead and dying from the acid rain. We don't burn coal to heat water to run a turbine anymore. We don't do that. We gasify it. It goes into a gasifier. What that does is it converts it directly into carbon monoxide and hydrogen, the exact same things that we use to make our fuel. You can do this with natural gas also. There's one problem associated with this, and that it also makes carbon dioxide. This carbon dioxide then gets kicked into the atmosphere or sequestered. Either way, it's a disposal problem, and it's a potential greenhouse warmer. But with our new technology that we've developed, we actually utilize the carbon dioxide as a fuel. 15% of the carbon in our fuel comes from carbon dioxide. So the net processing and manufacturing of this fuel utilizes carbon dioxide as a fuel source. You merge the carbon dioxide and you make CO and H2 when you merge that with methane and you make chains from that. It has an additional advantage uh, in that it operates at much lower pressures and lower temperatures. This process, called the fischer trope process, is not speculative. Uh, some companies have already done it. Uh, one company perhaps you've heard of is Shell. Uh, they build a plant off of that in Qatar. That plant cost $18 billion before they stopped expanding it. Uh, in Qatar, they want to be the king, the leader of fischer trope technology. So they give away the natural gas for free to anybody who will build it there off of that. Most estimates put the capitalization cost of that facility at about $140,000 per barrel per day. So to build a plant, you need $140,000 to build one barrel per day. Only thing is you need $18 billion in order to do it because it's a very large plant. Saisal is another plant. They're from South Africa originally. They started in this business for much the same reason the Germans stayed in this business. The oil was taken away from them during the times of apartheid. They are building plants locally using natural gas also. Independent consultants speculate that our facility, since it is lower in, at temperature and pressure for similar production type regimes, goes for about 60K per barrel per day. So that is less, that's, that is less, but the real advantage is a pilot plant uh, is $64 million to construct for the first economical one. We're building a proof of principle here in Louisiana at a site, and that should come up shortly. What's great about that is it brings this business from the regime of big oil to the regime of doable by standard venture capital techniques, and so hopefully it can proliferate across the world. I don't think you've really made the leap from basic science into applied defense research until you research bullets. That's, that's my guess, my best guess off of that. Well, we do bullets in our group. Lots of people have problems with bullets. The problem that my group have with bullets, of course, is you can't put sensors on bullets. Bullets accelerate too fast, and so you can't put off-the-shelf sensors that measure things on the bullets themselves. There are Department of Defense programs that serve to make really strong, good sensors that you can mount directly onto bullets. They're expensive. They're widely cited at maybe $6,000 per, uh, maybe up. The problem with that is the average army likes to shoot a lot of bullets when you get down to it, so that can add up. It would be nice if you could put off-the-shelf sensors on bullets. 
So what we do is we change the bullets. We make them half rocket, half bullets. So they accelerate at 500 Gs, allowing off-the-shelf sensors to be put onto these bullets. They still do reach traditional 50 caliber velocities. They take a little while longer to do so. Our first field test showed 10 for 10 of the sensors surviving. Those were RFID tags, so you can pick up the bullets after a conflict. The second funded research for that was acoustic sensors to listen for heartbeats. It uh, shoots the bullet. It's a rocket bullet. Uh, it then listens for a heartbeat. If it detects a heartbeat, you need another rocket bullet. So when we got into that, we found that rocket bullets have one advantage in that they don't have a traditional kick that they have there. So they can be made in something that doesn't even need rifling. Uh, so we got into the robot business. You can see a robot out on the hall if you want to afterwards. Uh, that robot uh, was named by a group as Little Kim because it has an attitude. You can go look at that. On that robot, one of my original grad students put a bumper sticker that says, guns don't kill people, rocket bullets shoot, and robots kill people. <laughs> I changed the bumper sticker to rocket bullets save lives, and, and I would stand by that, because in war, in conflict, in standard police actions, what you will have is, due to circumstances, it's decided legally that somebody's going to have to die. Those people oftentimes have a habit of surrounding themselves by perfectly innocent people that just wound up in the exact wrong place. Or perhaps that decision is made because they're a sniper in a tower. So if we can utilize sensors and bring small sensors into the small arms market, as the Air Force enjoys with bombs, we can make sure that conflicts are quick, inexpensive, and only the people that have already been decided that they have to die are going to go, and innocence can survive. So that's my group, and I thank you. Mm -hmm.